Hey there. This is really exciting for me to share this Toolbox Tools lecture with you on the concept of swing. Boy, I have a lot to say about it, and there certainly is a lot to say about this concept of swing. You know, it's really the indicator, the main indicator, I should say one of the main indicators of the jazz style. Um, this is really the sense of swing, the feel of swing is something that's really peculiar to jazz. You don't find it in any other style of music. So when we hear that, we just know it. It's just such a, um, uh, such a uh, integral part of this uh, jazz sound. So prior to going down, I've got about 20 different bunny holes I want to jump down and uh, explore um, as we talk about this concept of swing. I'd like to play some swing for you. So this is kind of a lecture, but a bit of a demo as well. So I was thinking of a song to share with you and uh, none finer came to mind than the Duke Ellington and Irving Mills song, It Don't Mean a Thing if it ain't got that swing. So this is from 1931, and I will not improvise over it. I'll, I'll hold on to my uh, trousers here, uh, but I'll just share the head with you. This is a typical AABA form, 32 measures in this swing style. So, super fun to play. All right, let's get down to business and talk about this concept of swing. The first thing I want to mention is, we should make a distinction, you should make a distinction between swing as a kind of an adjective adverb and swing as a more of a noun or proper noun. So, if we say, gosh, that guy really swings, his sound really swings, it sounds like swing. That's one thing. But if you and I also say, oh, this is from the swing era, as that song was, 1931, uh, released in 32, but written in 31, um, that's a different thing. So tidbit of information, just in really basic, really general terms, really broad-based, easy to remember sort of on the decade or on the five-year mark, the swing era in our country, in the United States, ran from about 1930-ish, these things are all very blurry, until through World War II, until about 1945-ish. And it's easy to remember, folks, because it's kind of bookended, I guess is the right word. Prior to the swing era, so, so in the 1920s and, and prior to that in the teens, we find a lot of small group jazz, Dixieland bands and, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, stride piano players and, and, and small groups. And in this, one of the indicators of this swing era, this 1930 to about 1945, is, is the emergence of the big bands. This is the era of the big bands. And, and when we say big bands, as you probably know, it doesn't mean that the band is actually big. The band is actually big, but it's sort of that very codified saxophones, trombones, trumpets, and a rhythm section. Piano, bass, guitar, drums, maybe a vibes player. Sometimes a singer out front. Sometimes a soloist out front, like the Benny Goodman big band where he stood uh, out front and played, or the Glenn Miller band or whatnot. So after, I guess I should mention the second bookend, which is after the swing era, after about 1945, the big bands start to get down into small groups again and we enter something called the bebop era, the bebop era. So just some really general terms. Um, 
swing era about 1930 to 1945. Something to keep in mind, the big band era. Okay, now back to the topic of this discussion, which is what is swing as a descriptor, as an affectation, as something that we sort of uh, imbue, we sort of uh, 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 bring into our playing, uh, whatever the instrument may be, even if it is a big band and, and this sort of sense of swing, where does it come from? How is it created? So the quick definition is this, and it's not very scientific. It's just a collection of eighth notes that are felt in a kind of a long, short pattern, in a long, short pattern. So um, if I had eighth notes that were just dot, 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 just like a, like a metronome or like a, a, you know, like a tick-tock clock or something like that, something that's very, very uh, strict and unwavering and predictable, but I superimpose this, uh, this uh, sort of disposition of the first one should be a little bit longer than the second one, that can get us this swing sound. So back to the tick-tock clock, even, metronomical, every one is exactly the same. Now I'll make the first one, I'll make pairings, and the first one will be long and the second one will be short. So like this, I'm gonna slow it down just a little bit. Pinning of that whole thing is this. Of course, I wouldn't play that, but I just wanted to share that sort of matrix, that sort of underpinning. Da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. That's the feeling of swing, long, short. Let's do an exercise together. I want you to participate in this. Take your least dominant hand. For me, I'm a righty, so I'm gonna take my left hand, and I'm gonna tap. I, I recommend tapping on your, on your knee, but uh, I'll tap up here so that you can actually see it as well. And this is just gonna be a constant, and actually I'm gonna make this left hand, my least dominant hand, a quarter note. Look. You don't even have to be a literate musician. This is just math. It's like uh, coins. It's like a quarter. If we have a dollar, that's a whole, <laughs> a whole dollar. And if we divide that into fourths, this is a quarter. Or if we take 100% and divide it into fourths, it's 25%. This is going to be a quarter note. This will be our fundamental in 4-4 four -four time or in common time. Just easy. Easy like that. And with my more dominant hand, I'm a righty, so with my right hand, I'm gonna do eighth notes. So I'm gonna do two over here for every one over here. And let's not even get into swing yet. Let's just get into this uh, independence, simple, simple independence of doing two against one, which is this. Okay, one and two and three and four and one and two and three, as musicians would say the four beats in a measure, and they say, and for the upbeat or the second eighth note. Here's the fundamental, the quarter note, if you will. One and two and one and two and one and two and three and four and one. Now try that game that I was doing earlier, which is long, short, long, short, long with your, with your right hand. Hopefully it sounds something like this. Da, bo, da. Okay. There's another challenge I want you to try. And this starts to get slightly improvisatory, which is to do the exact same thing here, this fundamental, this quarter note. And over here, I'm going to make stuff up. Da, whatever it happens to be, just a rhythm over here, and then I'll swing this rhythm. Ba ba do ba ga 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 do da da do da di da 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 di da do da. So I'll bring some closure to this first part of the of the lecture with that simple, 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 super simple 
uh, exercise for you. What does it mean to either tap your foot or to tap your hand so that you can feel a beat and then clap or tap a swing rhythm to, to experience swing eighth notes. If you need a training wheels, just put them all together. Ba, ba, do, ba, do, ba, do, ba, do. But it would be wonderful if you'd try to create a rhythm in that swing rhythm. I have a lot more to share with you in just a few moments. All right, let's keep going. I have uh, just a brief tangent that has to do with the visual. And you know, this lecture is really for everyone of musicians, non-musicians, uh, beginners, advanced people. It, it, this is really for the, uh, for the general populace, but it's, it's worthy of taking a quick moment of looking at the most, most basic nomenclature in music. So I'll have that appear here on the blackboard and I, will, I, I promise it'll just be a toe dip. But if you take a peek, if you see a measure, this uh, sort of cell, if you were, a, as it were rather, uh, in the upper left-hand corner of the image, you'll see a lonely circle, a little donut, a, a little marshmallow on a skewer. And this is called a whole note. This is the one that I've printed there is B. And it's just held for four beats. So we think one, two, three, four. And that talking point and that sheet that's there is really, um, it's like a ruler. It's like measuring something. If you have a whole inch, but you could cut that in half, you'd have a half an inch or a quarter an inch, an eighth an inch, a sixteenth of an inch. In music, it is exactly the same. So if you look at that uh, image there, uh, just to the right of the whole note, there are two half notes. And these are just that same circular dot, but they have a stem that comes out of them. And these are two beats of a piece, two beats each. One, two, one, two. Or if you're keeping track of what beat you are on in a, any particular measure, uh, many musicians would say one, two, three, four. Next line down. Again, I'm just going to zoom through this so we have a visual. You'll see four quarter notes. And these are notes that are solid with a stem that come off them. And these are simply one, two, three, four. They're one beat, one pulse each. And just to the right of them, and, and to the point of, of why I'm posting this, eighth notes look like that as well. They're solid and they have a stem that comes out of them, but there's usually a beam that goes across them, that beams them together. There are eight eighth notes. You can also, tangentially, you can also see them singly, and they have like a little flag that comes off from them, a little wavy uh, uh, thing there off the stem. But this that's on the page is this. One and two and three and four and da 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 one and two and three and four and so whole note two three four half notes one two quarter notes one two three and eighth notes one and two and three and four. They are each as I successively went on, they were half of what the uh, predecessor was. So a very, very logical thing. Okay. Here's the point I want to make and why I wanted to give you that visual. You and I were talking about swing and this swing feeling. Here's something that's kind of elusive. In writing, in writing music, eighth notes appear the same, whether it be straight or swung. And that can sometimes be challenging, uh, uh, really, but it depends on the context of where you are, who you're playing with, and really who the composer is and what their intention was. But swing was so pervasive, so commonplace, so naturally felt in so much music in American jazz from 19, you know, really from the 20s all the way up uh, 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 to the end of the swing era, 45 and beyond, that people just stopped writing in a swing style. It was just assumed that that would happen. So I have two quick examples for you. Um, Three, pardon me, three quick examples. I'll post the C major scale. There's nothing there except notes. They are eighth notes. That image sounds like this. It's just your typical C major scale. I'm 
playing those for you like this, da ga da ga da ga da ga, very evenly and very metronomical. However, I could play that simple scale this way with that long, short kind of gait that we felt earlier. You know, I could do it on other scales too. Etc. 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 The point. Just the notes don't tell us enough. They don't tell us enough. Those are all eighth notes. It depends on the context of the piece. Okay, here are two pieces from extremely disparate parts of the world and extremely dis disparate uh, time periods. The first one is a favorite of mine. I know you've heard it before, and it's this. Etc. Etc. Look in the um, very first few measures of this chart, and in the left hand, in the lower clef, you'll see two clefs that are sort of braced together. In the lower of those two clefs, you'll see a complete series of eighth notes. What we had just seen earlier, black dot after black dot after black dot after black dot, all beamed together. Four of them beamed together, eight per measure, which sounds like this. Uh, let's see here. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Wouldn't it be interesting, this is stylistically inappropriate, but wouldn't it be interesting if Mozart wrote this? Or I'm swinging the eighth notes. He had no intention of that sound whatsoever, but kind of a fun I guess I should play it this way. Et cetera, et cetera. I'm getting silly. The point. Context is everything. Mozart, classical period, straight. Let's do one more together just while we're having fun getting our feet wet with this swing thing. Here's an audio recording. I'll just play you the first little bit of this uh, Duke Ellington uh, song, Do Nothing Till You Hear From Me. I recorded this with a trio in 2015, a live concert. It was released called Duke's Diamonds. Uh, the saxophonist is Ralph Norris and the bass player is Marshall Wood. Um, so let's, uh, let's have a little bit of, little bit of listen uh, to this. Amazing, you know, you can so feel that sense of swing. When you look at this lead sheet, it says ballad, I guess, but it, it doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't really tell us is it swung, is it straight, or whatever. It, we just assume because it came from the pen of Duke Ellington and it doesn't specifically say straight eighth notes or Latin or something else that is implicit of straight that these would be swung. Etc. 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 Okay, I've got plenty more to share. Hey, so let's keep going here. There's three points that I want to make, and they really comprise the meat and potatoes of this uh, lecture. So, surrounding this sense of swing, surrounding this sense of swing, there's three things that I want to mention. One is 
a sense of swing, whether you're a, a practitioner, a musician, or not a musician, even if you're just a listener, a sense of swing can be developed uh, through culture, where you grew up, how you grew up, what you listened to. Think about that example in a non-musical way. Think about how children learn language of their homeland. Most people aren't teaching grammar or these types of things. They're those young, young human beings are learning by ear and they're, they're putting that together in their head all by ear. So the same thing for music. You and I, listening to music way back when we were little, little kids, this is, can be our first exposure to swing and a sense of swing and we can develop internally a sense of swing whether we're a player or not a player. So that's the first point. Uh, the second point is that over time, just like other things that we have, th this uh, sense of swing can evolve and it can change. So I know plenty of musicians, myself included, that sounded one way back when we first started playing and we sound a different way uh, the older that we get because this sense of swing has a tendency to evolve and to change. If you're a listener, that can also manifest just in, in the taste. Uh, so uh, what, what you liked to listen to at one point in your life, maybe you have evolved as a listener and don't particularly like to listen to that uh, anymore. The, uh, the last thing is, um, and this is an invitation to you, especially if you're uh, a novice musician or, or uh, um, really want to try a few experiments here along with this lecture, this sense of swing can be learned as a formula now, in the here and now. So even if you had, was not exposed to any swing uh, early on in life um, and you're not a musician, a sense of swing can still be established and inculcated and uh, uh, fostered right here, right now, through this, through this video. So I want to share those three things with you. Um, onward. I'm hearkening back to what we listened to earlier, the audio that we listened to earlier of uh, Ralph Norris playing Do Nothing Till You Hear From Me. He's a classic example. Ralph's a dear friend of mine. He's uh, in his uh, mid-80s. And when he first learned saxophone way back, almost 80 years ago, I'm sure, he learned by listening to Jimmy Lunsford records. And I know that I know this because he told me many times. He's this is how I first learned. You know, he had I think he had a teacher for a minute, but after that he was just figuring it out himself on his father's alto saxophone. And he learned by listening to records, to Jimmy Lunsford records. Let's take a quick moment, take 10 seconds, 15 seconds, and listen to a little Jimmy Lunsford to get a sound in our ears. <laughs> By our today's standards, that's such a dated sound. It's delightful, but it has a very dated sound to it. The interesting thing is, and I'm sure you could perceive this, is, I mean, Ralph is a saxophonist, and what we heard on his recording uh, uh, of Do Nothing Till You Hear From Me, which was just done in 2015, sure, it's a saxophone, but it doesn't totally sound like Jimmy Lunsford. So even though Ralph started by establishing his sense of swing by listening to Jimmy Lunsford records. His life evolved as a player and as a musician. He was around tons of other musicians, played in tons of bands, listened to a lot of other musicians, and so therefore his sense of swing evolved. That's the second point I want to make. Because we're friends, he you know, tells me all the time who his heroes are, and one of his heroes is Zoot Sims. And so let's take a, another quick moment, take 10 seconds, and just listen to a little bit of Zoot Sims um, playing Jive at Five and uh, get a sound in our ears here. <laughs> I'll bet you can draw some conclusions already as to how his sound, Zoot Sims's sound, is different than Jimmy Lunsford's. Uh, 
and maybe is a, is a tad bit closer to what you heard in Ralph's playing, at least in their sense of swing and what that feels like. So, and tangentially, I want to also add to this uh, second point, let's not forget that our own personality is a part of this sound. How we uh, choose to execute, if we're a musician, how we choose to execute this sense of swing is, you know, it's not just us trying to clone ourselves to sound exactly like somebody else. We take these influences and make them our own, make them our own. Um, historically speaking, uh, you know, uh, uh, Beethoven uh, was extremely aware of the work of Mozart, and, that, and Mozart was a huge model for Beethoven. Beethoven's earlier things sound very Mozartian, and yet later in Beethoven's life, his later works sound nothing like his earlier works. They sound really very markedly different. There's another sort of musical example of um, evolution, a musical evolution and how things can change. I also think of the painter um, uh, Degas, and uh, Edgar Degas, the uh, Impressionist, really one of the founders of the Impressionist movement, um, was very, very well schooled. He worked as a copyist, I, I believe, at the Louvre, uh, copying other uh, masters like Michelangelo. And yet his work doesn't look anything like Michelangelo's. So it's interesting, these things that we process, that we accept, that we assimilate, um, that we mimic or we copy or emulate, if we ingest them over time and make our own adjustments, that becomes our own style, our own sense of swing. I have some more points to share with you, so hang in there. I'm excited to uh, share them. All right, and so here's the third point that I want to make. And Frankly, this may be the most important point to you, um, especially if this is a skill that you would like to develop or um, you know, uh, apply to your own playing, even if you're a hobbyist and just a novice uh, player, whatever instrument that may be. And this is some encouraging news, which is this skill, this sense of swing, you don't have to be born with it. You don't have to be exposed to it when you're a little kid. You can learn it right now. And I have a formula that I want to share with you um, that seems to be a logical approach uh, to me uh, anyhow, and I hope that it resonates with you. So let's get started. This is um, based on something called a triplet. So a triplet in music, and, and again, I'm not going to go really too far down this bunny hole, especially if you're not a literate musician. I don't want you to be intimidated by this written language at all, but as a visual, I will share it with you. Uh, as in other contexts, triplet means three or, or a group of three. And so you'll see here on the image that if there are three notes, these three black dots that have stems, they are, they are all grouped together by this beam. And it's further emphatic in uh, music, in the written language. There's a little three over it. And I know you can see that. So it says, uh, you know, this, this says to our eyes, this is a triplet. So there's the first part. That's, the, that's probably the, 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 uh, the, the most intimidating thing is like, that's all it is. It's really not that intimidating at all. So it's the, the, the triplet and what it looks like. Oftentimes in music, in um, not just in these little isolated examples, but in, in actuality, we find triplets um, as a group together. And so you may see them like this, where there are four triplets. Each one of those gets a beat. And if we put four of them consecutively, that will take up one entire measure of common time or 4-4 four, four time. So that's the second visual that I want to uh, share with you. So why don't I take a moment and just play that first triplet, that first visual that you had was, was basically this. So I'm snapping a, a fundamental, a pulse, just, you know, like a little a clock, like a metronome or something like this. And I'm trying to play three distinct notes within the confines of each one beat. 
like that. And so that second visual where you have the four triplets all contiguously uh, uh, and, and connected and next to each other sounds like this. Ready? And... Musicians' parlance, they speak one and a, two and a, three and a, four and a. So, we're halfway there. The next thing is to tie together the first two notes in this uh, uh, triumvirate of notes, this trilogy, this uh, triplet here, to tie the first two together. So. Here's a visual, but I also want to share with you what a tie does in music. A tie is a combination. It's adding the two together where we, as practitioners, only articulate the first one, but we hold the value to include the second one without articulating it. So um, here's a, a, another a sort of uh, um, aural reference point. If I have a triplet and I articulate each of those triplets, it would be this. One and a, triplet, whatever that may be. If I take the first two and tie them together, I'll play the first one, hold for the second one, and play the third one. So here's a full triplet here. I'm gonna even go slower. I'm gonna tie the first two together. I'll even do it slower, just so we can really perceive this one, two, three, one, two, three, one and a, uh, two and a. Uh. Cool. The fourth point I want to make is, it's it, at this point, it is just a simple math uh, 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 equation. If you take two eighths and you put them together, well, you have a quarter. It's a simple math problem. So, and that looks like this. So that image, this image that we're looking at, quarter eighth, quarter eighth, quarter eighth, all under the umbrella of a triplet, is, a, is not the only place to start, but it is a marvelous place to start if you're trying to cultivate this sense of swing. So a, a, another example. This is just a matrix of triplets. I'll go a little bit faster, friends. Now, if I go back and play Do Nothing Till You Hear From Me, I'm going to have that feeling inside of me. So isn't that a neat connection? What a wonderful connection. Most people don't sort of stay right there. They only, their sense of swing only lives right there. They tend to be a bit more elastic with it and be a bit more organic with it. But again, as a point of beginning, as a place to start, as a place to get some terra firma, even for an experienced musician, if your sense of swing tends to waver and, and, and you're not in control of your sense of swing, this vehicle, this lesson, this little silly comparison uh, to the triplet is a very, very powerful piece of magic. It's a very, very powerful skill because it gives us that point of reference, a very strict point of reference, and it can build our confidence um, of you know, uh, a, a, a post to hang on to, a, a, a reference point, a touchstone, daka do, daka do, daka. And then from there we can meander and uh, travel as we wish. So I have a couple more quick exercises. The first is a challenge for you. No singing, no playing, just, just rhythm. Let's go right back to the ancient uh, uh, rhythm. And I'm gonna ask you with either hand to tap triplets. I'm using my left hand, and take your other hand 
and try to do that swing eighth rhythm where you're combining the first two triplets to create a quarter note under the umbrella of triplets. Yikes, I can't chew gum at the same time. Here we go. And if you want to dare, if you dare, if you want to have an extra challenge, trade hands. Now I'm playing the triplet up here and I'll play these swing eighth notes here. One last little exercise and then I'm gonna bring some closure here. Um, if you are a player, guitar, saxophone, kazoo, piano, whatever you play, use a metronome. Set a metronome, whether you have one of those sort of obelisk wooden pyramid things or whether you have an app on your phone. But set a metronome to a fundamental. This is my metronome for the video here. And play your scales against that. Or play melodies against that with that fundamental going here. Okay. I have more to share with you. I hope you're having fun thus far and I hope you're finding this enjoyable and practical at the same time. So more to come. All right. So uh, this is kind of the final segment of this lecture. Um, gosh, I hope this has been fun for you. Uh, I as with the other topics that I've presented, I really could uh, waffle on and on probably too long about these things, but I just love them very much and I love to sort of get inside simple concepts and really try to fully, more fully understand um, what drives them and what the makeup is. So to contribute to those three points that I made about having a sense of swing, there are other factors as well. And I want to mention one uh, here uh, for the purpose of this video. Um, and that is, there's a sense, uh, and, and really I think that it was probably born in a very organic fashion, but it, when we look back at the swing era especially and we uh, think about repertoire uh, from there, we hear a sense of accent, a sense of emphasis, a sense of weight on the second eighth note in these series of swing eighth notes. So here's a, here's a quick visual of the, um, uh, the C major scale. Uh, I'll play what's there, uh, sort of unaffected. Uh, I'll just play the notes without any deference to uh, any of the other indications that are there. Uh, so in a swing fashion. Play it a little bit slower. And. But if you and I look a little bit deeper at this situation, we can start to understand a little bit uh, more about uh, some of the uh, more subtle things that are a part of a swing feel. It's not only metrically, you know, this note is two-thirds and this note is one-third of a beat or th this sort of thing. There's a certain emphasis. And I'm using a couple of symbols here. This triangle looking thing is it called an accent. And that accent is, is adding more weight to that. So the other uh, symbol that's there is that simple uh, slur marking, which is this sort of smiley face, either this way or the rainbow that way. And it's um, uh, sort of implicitly connecting those two tones together, those two tones together. So I'm gonna play it nice and slow, but I'm gonna add this sort of sense of weight on the second eighth note. You can see, the, if you see those as pairs, the first two eighth notes, the accent is on the second eighth note. And uh, uh, consequently, all of them are as such, every other note. So here it is, a simple articulation on the C, but an extra emphasis on the D, simple articulation on the E, Extra on the F. OK. 
Okay. In time and swing. Two, three, four. So I'll be honest with you. I'm sorry. That's a bit obnoxious. I'm really going overboard here. Most people don't play with, with such emphasis. It's a lot more subtle than that. But you in your listening, in your playing, in, in, in your exposure to music, uh, in the jazz idiom, in the swing idiom, listen for that. Listen not only for the sense of da ba da ba da ba da ba, but that extra emphasis on da ba da ba da ba da ba da, and that can give us this wonderful, infectious, delightful, pleasant uh, feeling as it goes uh, with with the uh, as it goes with the um, allocation uh, uh, rhythmic allocation. So, here it is again. A lot of musicians say do ba do ba do ba do ba do, lowercase do, uppercase ba do ba do ba do ba do ba do, and yeah. So I'm kind of beating a dead horse here. Let me bring a little bit uh, of closure to the to the lecture. Um, I want to close with a very important point. I think is a very important point, and that is that a sense of swing is subjective. There's no objective, two plus two is four, this is the right answer. It's not that way. A sense of swing is like a sense of taste. Visually, or with the, with the palate for eating, you know, your, your Uncle Ernie can love liver and onions, but you yourself probably couldn't stomach them. Or, you know, for example, my, my wife loves stinky French cheese. It's, she just loves it. I couldn't be in the same room with that stuff. So it's a sense of taste. A sense of swing is really a very subjective thing. And it's subjective how we as musicians come up with that and, how, and, and that's sort of the flag that we individually wave. This is my sound. This is a part of who I am. I swing this way. This is my sense of swing. But the next musician waves a different flag. His sense of swing or her sense of swing uh, can be different. And us as listeners, as perceivers, as audience members, as appreciators of music, I think it's uh, uh, um, ill-advised to come up with sort of um, hard and fast opinions of, well, this swings and this doesn't swing, and this guy swings or this girl doesn't swing. It, it's a subjective notion, and that's a, it's a very important point that I want to leave you with. And what, you know, in, in the eyes or ears of one person uh, uh, sounds great and swings hard, um, in the ears of another person, it may not have that same uh, effect. I hope you had a ball listening to this. I really enjoyed sharing this little bit. Um, who knew that one could waffle on so much about one little subject? Um, believe it or not, I'm bringing some closure to this uh, lecture that is really earmarked for everyone, but I have two more lectures that are on the same subject matter, this what it means to have a sense of swing, uh, a lecture that is specifically for musicians, uh, students really of all ages, who want to refine their sense of swing and get a little bit more command. I have some great strategies uh, for, uh, for you uh, there. And then also a whole other separate video that is specifically for professional musicians. Um, and I have some strategies to share with my peers, with my peeps, as it were, here in uh, the world of music. So thank you again for your support. I hope you're enjoying these videos. Um, watching them, and uh, certainly as much as I am uh, in making them. And I have much more to share with you um, in the future. So thanks again. Enjoy. Have a great day. Have a great week.